Good afternoon and welcome to Dispatches. Uh, my guest today is Alex Thompson and we're going to be talking for uh, part two of our series about the psychological attack on UK. So Alex, welcome. Great to have you back. Thank you, Brian. We've had an unexpectedly positive response, I must say, to episode one of this series. Quite astonishing and, and uh, well, really pleasing. So we're going to say thank you very much to all the uh, viewers and listeners who've listened to our part one. Um, we thought it would be quite interesting today to actually have a little um, a little bit of discussion for a few minutes about some of the replies that people have posted. There's about uh, nearly 1,500 replies. I never imagined that this would um, capture people's attention in the way it has, so I'm really delighted. Um, but what a, what a brilliant spectrum of responses. We've had a lot of thanks. I'm not even sure there's any dislikes, although I understand there's, there's one or two people who said, can we work on the audio? And I'm very happy to do that. This is all happening from my end at home. Um, so I'm learning. So I'll say just bear with us a bit, but we will work on improving the quality. And um, uh, yeah, so I don't think we've got any dislikes. We've got lots of thumbs up and we've got some 1500 comments. Um, the nice ones were, of course, people who thanked us for what we were doing. We had quite a few people who said, yes, we agree. Um, you're helping to keep us all sane. So that was really excellent. Um, we had a lot of people uh, giving us information back. So they were encouraging us to look at documents and read books. And of course, people were putting in their particular take on who is behind this. Now, I'd just like to emphasize that we haven't yet got into the realms of really uh, who is who is behind what is happening today uh, in 2021. Um, we will get on to that. What we're doing at the moment is framing the background um, for the subject of psychological a uh, psychological attack. We're looking at material that people have written about it and we're starting to get some names um, and political movements coming into the spectrum. But we are not trying to pin it down at the moment. We're simply working through the background. I think so one thing that needs to be said on that, Brian, is a few people have knowingly nod, nod, wink, wink suggested. Brian and Alex know jolly well it's all the Jews' fault and if they say so, they'll get shut down. We do not believe it's all the Jews' fault. And that is not to say that we don't think there are any, uh, that there are no globalists uh, embedded in the various branches of Judaism, but that is a different matter altogether. I uh, agree with that. And thank you for bringing that up, Alex. This is, this is one of the things that um, quite, is pushed quite a lot um, and it, on particular websites. Um, how do I deal with it? I deal with it on the basis that um, all of my research over the years, when I look at the people who are causing the trouble, um, who, who are they? Well, the biblical advice is to judge them by what they say and what they do. The label doesn't really cut the mustard. You've got to look at what e each individual person is doing and saying, because the really bad guys, of course, can hide under all sorts of labels. They might call themselves Christian, they might call themselves a communist, they could say they're national socialist, they could call themselves Jewish. Um, but at the end of the day, um, if we take the Jewish community, there are many, many very good people who are getting or trying to get on with their lives and they are also completely unaware of the deep state politics uh, being <laughs> carried out, which poses a threat to them as well as any other identity. I have recommended it before, but if anyone with any you know, bona fides wants to look into this and wants to see that just a classic Orthodox Jewish rabbi in an English speaking country can understand Illuminism, globalism, psychological attack, and see that it's coming from outside his own faith tradition, although it may have infested his faith tradition, read a Boston rabbi's two volume book called To Eliminate the Opiate, written by Rabbi Marvin Antelman. I think that's about the best I have come across within Judaism. And it's equivalent to sim similar books written by Christian and Muslim clergymen who've seen the same thing happening, uh, it w coming from without uh, or at the fringes of their own faith community, whereby their own 
uh, flock find themselves physically and psychologically attacked by people claiming the same religion as them? Yes, well, we, 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 we're not showing away from this discussion in any, in any way. But Alex and I are saying that at the moment we're going to work through our series and we will get on to this, this very important, well, it's, a, it's the key part, isn't it, of who is actually driving the problem. What we're looking at at the moment is what is being done, what form it takes, how it's being done, what is this psychological attack. Now, I've digressed a bit. Let's come back to these comments. Um, I have to put my glasses on for this, um, an age thing, of course. I've got Leveller Lou, who says for Lady Gaga to be chosen, isn't it proof that we're being laughed at, humiliated? Now, this was a comment towards the end of the uh, first part where I pointed out that the World Health Organization had used a pop star to try and convince us to stay in our homes. And uh, Alex, isn't it fascinating? The very same pop star is used um, at uh, the Biden inauguration. No longer wearing a, a raw meat dress, uh, but you know, sporting some kind of uh, ridiculous pom-pom skirt and uh, a massively oversized bird brooch with some symbolic uh, intent. And of course, massacring the Star Spangled Banner. For one thing, she was singing it in March time, not triple time. Uh, you know, this is a defacement of the national anthem. Right. Well, I didn't pick up the timing issue, but I did pick up the uh, the very big bird on her jacket and, of course, her extraordinary dress. And you're quite right. If she'd stood up there in her meat dress, if people haven't seen that, go and have a look for it on the Internet, Lady Gaga and the meat dress, uh, we would have seen her in her true colours. Now, what else have I got here? I've got uh, believing everything the government says is the new virtue. That's by Fish Seabass. Uh, that was a week ago. We've got a Stephen Girling who said hypocrisy is the new democracy. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, we've got Phil Welby Parry, who has said the UK column are keeping me sane. So that's really good. Um, we have politicians not following the rules. Uh, celebs telling us to stay at home while they're thousands of miles away on ho holiday. So people picking up that hypocrisy, that's Billy Bob Dog. Uh, I'll just give one more and then I'll, I'll let you have a go, Alex. Um, uh, Stuart Rutherford said, we're all just pawns in a never ending political game. Uh, this one says, Alex Thompson is the smartest man on the planet. And that's by A. Scott. <laughs> so that was a nice one. Um, Boiling Frog says the Church of England ceased to be spiritually relevant decades ago, um, and that's pretty topical. Now, the other one, which I can't find in the 1500 odd replies or close to 1500 replies, uh, but there was a lady who said, I got as far as them talking about women, and that's that was enough for me. So a lady got very upset that we were starting to comment on the fact that women uh, were being put in positions of power, uh, the military we mentioned, and we're going to come on to that again in this edition. And she confused us reporting the message or the policy with what we may consider ourselves. And I want to reiterate this because it's very important. We are seeing that in this very cynical psychological attack on UK, uh, women are being heavily targeted. They're being used, they're being damaged, um, but they are being used as political pawns. And it's important that we understand this. It's important that women understand this uh, because it's, it's the same, for example, sorry, probably a bit of background noise just come in there, um, but also, um, we see how people, for example, with disabilities have been used. At one stage, we had the government, um, you couldn't move without the subject of disability coming up and looking after disabled people and disabled access. But now we're in, we're in a society in UK where we see that the government is absolutely not interested by any form of vulnerability or disability. So the disabled have been used. And I'll also add, it's very clear that the gay community are being used, but we'll have to leave that as part of our discussion later in the series. So Alex, uh, any, any particular comments from viewers and listeners that you picked up on? Start with, for every 
woman who was offended by that, and I counted two, including the comment you quoted there, there was about five times as many uh, female viewers, as far as I can tell from a range of ages and social backgrounds, looking at the way they write, uh, who said, I have not the slightest problem with what Alex and Brian are saying here. And uh, in fact, the uh, young lady who's, well, not even young anymore, the 30-ish year old lady whom uh, I couldn't remember by name last time, Sandra Fluke, who in 2012 uh, was put forward by the, the radical wing of the US Democrats uh, to campaign for uh, pretty much free and universal access to, uh, to taxpayer funded condoms in student accommodation is a classic ex example, of course, because as Mark Stein, the commentator, wryly said at the time, she'd been in education for a quarter of a century and in, as much had been spent on her education as on some minor European princeling would have been spent in the past, millions, mostly not seen, of course, because it goes through grants and, uh, and trust funds, but that's the, the, the amount of money spent on the education. But she was playing it very cute in a way that women would be far less reticent than we would to say. Uh, she was fronting up to what's in the last decade they, they've increasingly openly said are um, you know, a, a bunch of, of uh, old out of touch white men who how, how dare they have anything to say on our sex lives uh, precisely because she was a presentable woman and without turning on the waterworks she was kind of tugging on the heartstrings there and saying if you deny me this Marxist requirement uh, of the promotion of sexual free-for-alls on campus then you are making poor little me a vulnerable and potentially pregnant woman uh, this is a very deliberate agenda actually uh, so no, we don't take back what we said. Uh, I was willfully misunderstood, I think, by one lady as uh, saying that any woman uh, who wants a top job is a shrill harridan. I said quite carefully that the types of women who get to the top, whether it's the Church of England or the government or a think tank, are the shrill type by the time they get to the top. Well, here is one from uh, Craig Michael Grice, who tells us he finds himself at the age of 60 looking at Britain and its people in disbelief. And he rather crucially sees that the thing is, quote, people do not want to be free. They're comfortable in their own enslavement. This is something a lot of our commenters notice, the numbing power of psychological attack, loving your, your slavery as Orwell, and uh, in a different way, Huxley describe it in their books. Craig adds, the process that you and Alex are highlighting has been so gradual that they haven't noticed. Now some, but not many, see that their freedom is slipping away very rapidly. The hour is upon us now. We must fight for and support. And he doesn't even say ourselves, but our fellow man. So the mindset that's coming to the fore in some of these comments is most of the people I love and care about are still asleep. And I want to wake them up in whatever way I can without harming them further. Others say we are, I feel we are now at war with our governments. Uh, that comment is by forever living, forever young with Gillian. Um, I would say, yes, I would refine that and say that our governments have declared war on us. Um, Slightly pithy one here. Simon Goldstein is saying, Brian, the Pitbull Gerish and Alex, Tommy Gunn Thompson. Glad you're both on our side, boys. Uh, to which I replied, Brian bites and I rattle because you're called the Pitbull and I, I'm called the Tommy Gunn. But there's a bit of truth in that. You know, you, uh, you do have quite a bite in the irony that you uh, and the understatement that you, you put out. And I think that's possibly one reason why people have been drawn to this series, actually, more than we expected, is that we are wry and dry about what we say. James of the Isaac family says, police and the military, which is by the way our topic today, have been purged of the honest and experienced policemen and soldiers. And SG Gaming says, that for me has been one of the biggest disappointments of this quote pandemic unquote, the church and my fellow Christians not resisting. Well, I think we're beginning to see uh, what, what process has gone on there. Um, yes, I could, I could read many more of these, but we're getting the sense of this. It has resonated with people, Brian. Alex, it absolutely has. And um, it, it's been brilliant to see all these comments because uh, a lot of um, uh, what, well, what do we want to do? We want to be able to engage with people. And of course, the feedback starts to show us whether what we're putting out is, is impacting and whether, whether people are picking up on it and they're engaging with us. So we're going to say, thank you very much for the comments. And I hope when this is actually um, posted up to the uh, UK Column YouTube channel, uh, we get a similar um, similar amount of comments and we, we'll do the same thing again. We'll with a little bit more diligence, we'll see if there's some 
particular ones of, of uh, interest and we'll bring those forward. For the large number of people who are watching us from their YouTube uh, channel subscription only, uh, they're getting a notification or a share, you can find the articles and the texts that we're referring to by looking at the covering piece in which this video will be embedded and you get them as always by going to ukcolumn.org. Get in the habit of looking there first and foremost because of the increasing censorship. Okay, right, thank you for that Alex. Now, um, the, the source of our discussion was a book by Christopher Storey and the book was the EU collective enemy of its member states and we were particularly focusing on a table which is in the first few pages of that book and the table is called the National Destabilization Plan of KGB GRU based on Soviet defector intelligence. And uh, we'll put this up in the video so you will be seeing it coming into the video. Um, now what the table showed, just as a recap for anybody who's, who's come into part two raw, is that uh, the left hand side was a column of ideas, religion, education, media, culture, then there was the methods that were to be employed to demoralize and then there were the intended results what was to be achieved by this demoralization attack and the plan was to take place over 15 to 20 years and it was to be followed by a subversion phase that was going to take us into actual destabilization of western nation states and alex had in part one which if you haven't seen, I'd encourage you to go back and watch, talks about some of the, de the defectors who were actually providing this information at the time. So we're coming into the, the table now, um, starting at structure. The first part was ideas, religion, education, media, culture. We're now into structure, and we're going to look at the areas to be attacked, and they are law and order, uh, um, social relations, security, internal politics, and foreign relations. So that's the next section. Um, Alex, before we get started, do you want to add anything to that? Perhaps simply, why is it that there is a, a section A of the table about ideas and then a section B about structure? It's because these are the ways to get people to do what you want. You can do so either economically by uh, financial incentive or ideologically, by putting ideas in their head, and ideology has been very usefully defined as things in people's minds that justify action to be taken or not to be taken, where it would otherwise not be taken or would be taken. So it's things between people's ears, as it were, that affect the real world, is what we were discussing in section A of the table last week. Uh, and that's why David Scott always says, follow the money and follow the ideology to find out what's going on. These two are incentives to get people to do what they want. But the political theorists of all cultures and uh, times have said there is a third way, which is simply uh, the iron fist, whether or not in a velvet glove, simply to say, do this or you'll be beaten up or lose your life and your liberty. And that's the situation we're in now. The, the, the middle section of this table, law and order, social relations, security, internal politics and foreign relations, all relate in some way to the government's, as, as many philosophers have called it, the government's monopoly of power. A monopoly, of course, that we gave it for our own good and in our name, and not for, to justify the existence of a government as, it's, as itself, as it were. But that's why these, these items are bracketed together, even though if you've grown up in an English-speaking country, you'll be more likely to think of these as totally disparate areas. You're going to be thinking about, by law and order, you're going to be thinking about a constabulary or police force, security, you're going to be thinking about spooks, foreign relations, you might be thinking about diplomats, but these are all different suits, different guises for a, a man or increasingly a woman who comes along and says, uh, we have an overwhelming force and we're going to launch it at you if you don't comply. Okay, and I'll, I'll just also add to just help set the scene and, and in fact remind people, we're following through the plan as set out on this table. And one of the things that we said in part one was, isn't it amazing that you can, you can look at the intended attack and you can look at the results, the intended results, and you can say to yourself, this is happening in UK. This is one of the things that I stress. When I saw this table many years ago and I read through it, it just fitted the picture I was seeing unfold around me. So let's get into it then. The first one, well, it's number five in the actual list. Uh, it's law and order. It says that um, 
what's going to be done? Well, legisl uh, legislative, imposed, inconsistent, unwarranted bias in favour of the offender, victimisation of the victim. So you're going to take a law system which should be about truth and honesty and justice, and you're going to effectively turn it on its head. You're going to inject bias. You're going to um, be in favour of the offender and you are going to further victimise the victim. That's really turning the thumbscrew. And what is the intended result that was desired? It was mistrust of justice, legal cynicism, um, and in the EU context, because this book was heavily focused on EU politics, justice is whatever promotes the EU's interests. Um, it's also got here, but I think it falls under the next one actually, so I'll leave that. So I'll just recap that. So we are, we are putting, that we're making the law biased, um, we're in favour of the offender and we're victimising the victim. Where have I seen this for myself? I have seen this inside the family courts where the families and, and the children themselves, of course, overwhelmingly victims of circumstance, of, of uh, poverty or whatever it is, do they get assistance and support from the court? No, they are actually further victimized and oppressed. Alex, bring you in. What's your take? Because you are doing your own private work at the moment to um, help uh, boost your professional knowledge on the law. Yes, um, I think what's important with the law is people hear a word and they assume it means a certain thing and don't look carefully enough. Uh, often the law is about taking a person or a situation that's been described by one turn of phrase that's in common use and saying, ah, what is this at law? How can we define these relations at law? That's a different matter. So people might have heard what you just read through and thought this is about going soft on the accused, uh, whether it's a rape trial or whatever. But that isn't the case because the accused should be uh, given the benefit of the doubt. Uh, the burden of proof in the common law system is on the prosecutor to prove the case against the accused because it's an express provision, as Samantha Baldwin has said, one of the most eloquent of the recent victims of the family courts uh, in a case of Satanist ritual abuse of her children, and as so often uh, the court taking the side of the abusers. Samantha Baldwin has said that the best masters of English law have said that uh, it is better for 10 guilty men to walk free than for one innocent to be convicted. So the overall thing to focus in here uh, on is that uh, Christopher Story is not saying there will be a, a bias in favour of the accused, which is only right and proper, otherwise we all live in tyranny, but it's an un unwarranted and inconsistent bias in favour of the offender. Now an offender is one who's already been convicted to the high evidentiary standard of the common law. You can only pull this trick of bias in favour of the offender by having protocols in place which say that when you weigh up sentencing or the length of time in prison or the conditions of bail, release and probation, uh, you bring in a load of uh, doctrines about uh, the man was not really guilty of the perhaps the sexual uh, violence that he inflicted or whatever it may be, or the, the wrecking of a shop belonging to someone of a different social group, uh, because he had, uh, shall we say, a, a hatred in his soul which had been nurtured by injustice. So Marxist doctrine has come into the manuals which are sent out by the Home Office or equivalent in other Western countries. Uh, to uh, judges when they impose sentencing. Ju juries don't decide on sentencing even where they do get to say so uh, in convicting these days. Uh, and likewise we see in the other column the results that justice to the EU is whatever promotes the EU's interests. Uh, this isn't talking about individual cases of course, this is a more of a, the other wing of what, what Marxism does with justice, which is that it neutralizes the meaning of the term which is meant to be a standalone noun by adding adjectives to it. We want social justice. We demand racial justice. There must be economic justice, as the churches are often told to say these days. We must have environmental justice. By putting those adjectives in front of the noun, you often undo what would be a fair and square justice 
just using that word on its own in the situation by saying, ah, but when we tip the scales, this is the, the connection with the uh, individual offender again, when we tip the scales by saying the offender is really innocent and in the old piety of the 1960s, it's us, we are all guilty, society has caused this, you cause the outrage and you blacken the name of society, which is the whole point, because it is our societies that we are being attacked even if you have just watched part one and it's fresh in your mind, and certainly if you haven't, bear in mind that this is, it's for shorthand, a Leninist or Trotskyite attempt to bring down, in, in broadest, the broadest possible terms, Christian Western society, particularly the English-speaking jurisdictions and societies, because of the hatred of how those societies work. So it's society, all of us, that are being attacked. We see how Black Lives Matter have been able to go out and break the law um, with impunity. Um, their actions have not been um, effectively policed, they've not been brought before the law, but other people going out on demonstrations with, we'll say a counter opinion if we keep it, if we keep it simple, are absolutely picked up and brought in front of the law and they're actually sentenced as a result. Just as one example of what I see around, we, we've got the Black Lives Matter and, and other people who are putting a, across different opinions, particularly if the state can get a right wing label on them, then the law in policing and the law in how they're treated in courts is, is very different. And um, so I, I start to look at this and say that because it's coming across uh, in an orchestrated way, this has got to be planned. It can't be uh, an accident. It can't be coincidental. This is it. And just to throw in one example there, uh, we, we often overlap quite closely in, in viewership with people who are concerned for men's rights, although there's many labels stuck on them. People don't like being called men's rights activists if they're not quite in that category, but that broader category, people concerned with men's issues and justice, real justice for men in family courts. John Waters is a great advocate for this, for example, having been through the ringer himself. And uh, one thing that's notable there is across the English speaking world, originally coming out of uh, Duluth, Minnesota, in the United States is this Duluth doctrine or Duluth process, uh, which has been rolled out across police forces across the Western world, particularly the English speaking countries, which says if you find a domestic incident ongoing, you must arrest the man because by definition, he's the oppressor. Pure, you know, pure categorical Marxism again. I'm going to say that in this section, there is some overlap in, in the table and the, the areas targeted. Um, I was going to add in this section, which was to do with law, the fact that we are, we are seeing elements of society given a promoted, a protective position over others. We, we've got the issue of colour, whether you're black or not. We've got whether you are gay or not. Uh, we've got whether you are now calling yourself, you're a man and you're calling yourself a woman or a woman calling yourself a man. The state is, is saying that actually you're not all equal. Um, if you're in one of these minority groups, the state is going to give you protection. And you can see that in uh, that one side is allowed to speak out publicly and state what their opinions are, whereas people who try and um, give a counter narrative, the state closes down on them. So before it's even got near a court, it seems to me that we, we now have operating in a, inside our society a bias in how justice is, is actually carried out. Yes, this, is, this begins with the police forces who at law in the common law are only there to do the work of all of us. And they, meant, they are meant to per collect uh, incriminatory and exculpatory evidence, that is evidence that you did it and evidence that you didn't do it with the same zeal, but of course they won't particularly if their heads are pumped full of uh, doctrines that come out of Marxism through their training. The same applies to other uh, professions with a monopoly of violence, but uh, first and foremost, the police in the, and the secondarily, the, the, the state monopolies of prosecution that are creeping in across the English speaking world copied from the continent, uh, which both say, uh, we will not even entertain the thought that you are guilty or that you are innocent because you belong to this social group. The other thing about the police, which we should put in there, Alex, is that when, when we see the police openly stating that they are going to uh, be supportive of the, well, let's say, the LGBT movement, uh, the rainbow movement, to the extent that the police will be there on the streets with some form of modi modification to their uniform 
to show their alignment to the to the LGBT movement. Um, but um, uh, this means that they're they're actually flaunting their bias in front of the public. And Your of- local police force, Devon and Cornwall, has had this because there was a preacher threatened by the police, very much at the core of what we're describing here, in Newquay in Cornwall. And uh, of course, this uh, led to uh, uh, him confronting the police in, in some lawful way and saying, what are you up to? Uh, UK Column then wrote to Devon and Cornwall police to ask for their statement on the matter. They wouldn't answer the points we put to them. The preface, press office even took it upon themselves to say, for fairness, we you know, somehow order you now to go and take a statement from our uh, pet Stonewall member. Uh, whom we march with, who who is the complainant in this case, because uh, for balance, you must listen to him. So, you know, where's the line here between policing and uh, the pushing of um, certain views of of homosexual rights? And the police are acting as a result of the policy that's being injected and also their training. Many people are asking us, why are the police behaving like they are at the moment? Well, the simple answer to that is that they are being trained Uh, to police in the way they are. They're being trained to have many of the thought processes that they have. And this is really now starting to impact on how they police individuals. They're aggressive. Why are they aggressive? Because they've been taught that if you put forward a counter narrative to the police, you are some uh, potential right wing so, so we see then, Brian, that section A precedes section B in the table, because even where you have people swinging handcuffs, truncheons, tasers and guns, what they will do to use those weapons uh, will depend upon what's already in their heads. So the ideas go before the structures. And when people talk about the takeover of society, if they have any sense like these wicked Leninists uh, and Trotskyites, they will not begin by training the police, but they will begin by taking over the BBC and the churches before they even get to any of the power agencies. This is the Gramscian strategy, of course, Antonio Gramsci, G-R-A-M-S-C-I, talking about the long march through the institutions because he realised that Marxism had failed to take over, particularly the Christian Western and above all the English speaking countries, because people were too content with their lot in those countries. First of all, they needed to be made discontent. They needed to be shown for a few decades sermons and television uh, dramas, which told them how rotten they were. Yeah. I'll come back to the subject of, of the, the child abuse, because this, this one is, is very important, but it's also very em- emotive. We have seen over many years uh, um, a very inconsistent application of the law uh, to people who, who are involved in the abuse, abuse of children. And, and very often that inconsistent inconsistency is flaunted in front of the public by the media in order to ramp up the um, the backlash, to ramp up the mistrust of justice, so we see some people um, who who are caught for abuse of children, or maybe it's child pornography, um, they get a harsh sentence. Then you will see somebody else who's picked up who seems to get a remarkably light sentence. Or if we get into the realm of our politicians. Uh, we get to the stage that where there is clear evidence and evidence available to the police that the politician has been involved in abuse of children, um, that isn't even allowed to come into a court. That is suppressed before it even gets to that level. What does this do? It fosters outrage in the public. It builds pressure. But all of this, to my mind, is a prime example of inconsistent inconsistency, which has been brought into law in UK. Alex, do you think that UK can stand on the world stage now and say, well, my goodness, it's only the United Kingdom that has a true sense of justice um, come to our democracy. Does this still apply anymore? Of course not, but uh, for full details of that, you'll need to wait a couple of episodes in our ongoing series, A Dissident's Guide to the Constitution, till we get to the episode on the rule of law, because that's the catchphrase that Britain and America use around the world, having been captured by Marxism, uh, to say that you must all copy our way of doing things. Uh, no, it, the, the, uh, it, it applies to a couple of other comparable countries like the Netherlands, where I'm speaking from. These countries think that because they score very highly on um, corruption and transparency rankings, that they really do have excellent justice systems. 
because it is a rare but not unknown thing for British judges, for example, to say, uh, I demand payment for this judgment, the old, the old uh, you know, naked corruption. It does happen. It's been described by people on, think, for example, the judges behaving badly blog with name states and places. Uh, but generally that doesn't happen. So we kid ourselves that our system is hunky dory uh, simply because people usually lack the ability to prove what happened to them because it happened behind closed doors. And as, as David Scott will be quick to say, the Scottish model of government has perfected it. Uh, the way that the Scottish Law Society works, for example, it's a complete stitch up that you'll never realize that the people making the decisions all went to the same university and were in the same student club together. Or that, for example, you won't get a lawyer to stand up for you and, and show that there was a problem in your case, because as David has, has identified more narrowly, uh, no Scottish legal practice can stay in business without uh, a master insurance policy in place, which is administered by major law firms within the charmed circle of power. So they demand as part of your insurance to know all the dirt on you. So the insurers for councils for courts, for, well, not so much courts as such, but for legal professions, uh, comes from a couple of people who demand to know all the compromat on you uh, so that you can continue practicing. So at, just at that level, uh, we've got a, a very ingenious system in Scotland and more generally in the UK and the English speaking world, which is not going to be discovered easily, which allows our politicians to tout themselves right up to the UN Security Council stage saying, uh, we in the US are the best in the world. We're, I think we should leave law and order there. Um, what we'll say to our audience, is it just us or do you also feel an inherent mistrust in 2021 of the justice system in UK? Do you honestly believe that if you went into a, a court, that, that court would be giving you a full and fair hearing in front of a jury of your peers? And it would be those uh, jury members who would be given the ultimate responsibility of deciding whether you were guilty or not. Do you believe that this is the system or do you believe that um, there is a, a, a clear calculated political bias that's being fed through to the um, judicial system, the judges in particular, that means you're not going to get a fair hearing because that is how I see it. Clear evidence of that, actually. Uh, again, Scotland in the lead on this point. They're now starting to put nakedly in the statutes things that used to be just uh, in practice directions coming from the attorney general or just standards ethics in the profession, which is that judges are now being told in the text of the law in Scots law, uh, when the jury is told uh, this man, uh, well, whatever it may be, for example, in, in a rape case, because that's politically a, a hot potato, that's a common example used, uh, the judge will now have a duty, not just the freedom, to direct the jury and say, you didn't hear that, or you mustn't, uh, you mustn't bear that in mind, you know, or in other, other cases, you have a duty to find the defendant guilty completely unlawful, but that's, that's that stage of directing the jury, which you have seen happening in Portsmouth at the other end of Britain, is a clear example that sometimes juries are in danger of getting a fair and just presentation of the facts of the case. And at these moments, judges or prosecuting lawyers leap in and say, you didn't hear that. Um, because this is such a, um, an important and really detailed subject, Alex, I think we're gonna have to say, let's, um, um, later on in the series, maybe we're going to have to do a special bit on the law. Um, we need to move on through, through our table here to keep the flow going. But um, I'll just leave people with a, with a challenge, really. I started to investigate where judges came from. And of course, in UK, judges are appointed by the Judicial Appointments uh, Panel. Um, and uh, that ha they have a website. You can go and look at them. My question was, who appoints the Judicial Appointments Panel? And when I started to ask that little question, um, the system did not seem to want to reply. So if anybody can help us out here, uh, it's not who appoints the judges, it's who appoints the panel that appoints the judges. For those who are wondering why this is important, this is a big issue in legal philosophy around the world, judicial appointments. Britain is supposed to have got it sorted six years before the political act of union between England and Scotland in the Act of Settlement 1701, when having turfed out an absolute, absolutist king and brought in one subject to his coronation oath, we tidied that up a year, a decade later by saying from now on in the Act of Settlement, the king doesn't hire and fire the judges. Uh, but we never got to the fine points of how they can be recalled. It's a big thing in the US as well, because we've ended up with a situation where the European continent under civil law says you must have lifelong appointments to guarantee judicial independence so that the government can't threaten to fire, to fire them. 
some Central European countries, notably Poland and Hungary, have now said if a judge is an obvious Marxist agitator or uh, sexually depraved, we must be able to get rid of him. And this is the point at which, as, as per the right hand side of the table on this point, number five, this is when the EU comes in and says it's not in our interests for you to be able to get rid of corrupt judges. So we're going to slap the label on Poland and Hungary of being countries not subject to the rule of law. Now, this is why Brian has just made this point. Uh, we need to know who appoints those who appoint the judges. We do know that under Blair, uh, the stage of getting to a Queen's Council, which is the stage before judge as a lawyer, uh, was something that went to a quango and uh, a, a body now called QC appointments. But we don't know who appoints the Judicial, judicial Appointments Committee. So we suspect it will be a, a club of judges within the charmed circle again, because the old way of judicial appointments is co-option by other judges. Right. Thank you for that, Alex. Right, let's move on to the next topic on this table of uh, demoralisation, and it's social relations. Uh, what does it say? It says that uh, there's going to be rights, not obligations, and this is going to lead to erosion of individual responsibility. So I find this line extremely interesting because it is so important, it's so powerful, and the attack has been so deep and so widespread, but it only gets one line. Social relations, it's gonna be attacked by rights, not obligations, and that's gonna give erosion of individual responsibility. And before I hand over to you, uh, Alex, I just want to say uh, for the audience, just think about the battles that we now see in our society at a social level. We've got the war of the sexes. We've now got to the stage where, according to the mainstream press at least, there's a war going on because you're a man or a woman and you're gonna be at each other's throats. We've got the war now going on between people who are heterosexual and people who are gay. We've got problems for the gays because now we've got a new group of people who've been created that don't know whether they're a man or a woman or whether they're entirely gay or maybe they're bisexual. And this, 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 this group is expanding and each time the, the social group expands, the elements of it are given more and more powerful rights and those rights invariably start to impinge on the freedoms of the majority. And this is, this is expanding very, very quickly now. So we can see that. Um, what else can we see happening? Well, of course, we, we've got distrust by the color of skin. This is something that the media um, has stoked up and emphasized. And I've said in some of my talks in, in other places, the very early on, I found it interesting when the um, wife of a policeman told us how her husband had changed as a result of doing diversity courses inside the police. And as a result of those courses, um, he became heavily focused on whether somebody was black or white. Uh, whereas before, he just treated them as an individual. He didn't really think of that. So these were poisonous seeds that were put in the, in the minds of the policemen and uh, those poisonous seeds were uh, applied behavioral psychology, which has then grown into this wider policing, which we don't like. So we've got that side. We've also got the spiritual uh, divisions that have been created, whether you're Christian or Muslim or you're a Buddhist or whatever. Uh, previously, people had their uh, individual faiths and most of the people who had a, at least um, um, a faith of significance, um, of history and significance, would be prepared to debate with other people on a perfectly peaceful and reasoned level. But now we've seen that stoked up by the government, by the mainstream media, so that we've got people at each other's throats. So, Alex, it seems to me, if we look at our society, we have indeed got a broken society and that society, our society has been broken uh, to a large extent by the attack on the relationships between people at a social level. The reason, Brian, why this is a short, pithy one-liner is because unlike the other four bullet points in this section, there is no uh, man with a truncheon involved. Social relations is horizontal. It's citizen to citizen, you to me. 
And you cannot, as you can with the other four areas, with police, uh, spooks, politicians and diplomats, you cannot supply a Marxist uh, training manual uh, that says in this situation favour Marxism. Uh, because that would require complete scripting. The closest you can get is by putting a script, uh, uh, what Jordan Peterson would call the, the substrate algorithm in people's heads, uh, to, to, to knee-jerk react and say, that's disgusting, I can't believe you said that, and to shut their ears and their mind off to what's being said, even if it's a family dinner table. Uh, so that's what uh, has been gone for. It's a cultural uh, way of inveigling Marxism into people's minds so that they're not receptible or susceptible to uh, new ideas uh, or to being persuaded that they were wrong about their cousin or their colleague. So that's why there isn't as much detail on strategy as there is for the other areas. It's enough to have got your way into people's minds and once having wormed your way in there to say never ever uh, sus suspect for a moment or entertain the idea that there might be merit in what your opponent has to say, dehumanize them. Uh, so that's that's why that's a short area. But my goodness, haven't we seen a lot of this happening in UK column casework, people describing how uh, they can't talk to a boss or uh, a parent or a child or a cousin uh, because of this. And I would add to that also that Christopher Story in putting this table together is not saying uh, that, uh, that we don't have rights. He's not saying this awful dialogue of rights is, is pernicious. We've had centuries of the common law and liberty under law being built up by the emphasis on rights. The trick that's being played is that a, a new kind of rights are being substituted. Now, we can't go into great detail, but I would refer people to the catch-all page for our constitutional podcast series, which is ukcolumn.org slash constitution. They can also go to soundcloud.com slash ukcolumn slash sets and find the Dissident's Guide to the Constitution there, but without so much of the write-up. Best to go to the ukcolumn.org slash constitution page. And you will see that we've already dedicated in the opening section of that podcast series, an entire episode to this question of rights. And uh, to make a long story short there, the question is, is a right an immunity, don't touch me, or is it an entitlement, gimme? Because once you've gone from don't touch me to gimme, you suddenly have a right that interferes with other people clean contrary to common law and moral uh, common sense, uh, which is I've got a right to live in a happy, what, what should we say, uh, to live in um, uh, a house of a certain monetary standard and a certain income. I, I can only enforce that right by getting other people to steal your stuff to give it to me. Uh, I've got a right, for example, to live free of religious opinions I don't like or political opinions I don't like. Well, I can only enforce that by getting the police to go along and arrest you for calmly discussing your opinions and convictions, Brian. So I don't know, you might want to come in at this point and discuss uh, perhaps your, the impression you've gained of how people's heads are being messed with and perhaps the trend you're seeing now that you've been receiving communication from people for over a decade. Well, um, I'd, I'd like to go back a bit further than that, Alex, and, and this is where age helps, because if I go back 30 or 40 years, I lived in a very different society and people of more, more mature years, as we're allowed to call them for this edition, um, recognize this. There, there was an inherent peace in the way that people dealt with each other. If you, if you went into a bank, you, you dealt with a, um, a cashier, usually would be a lady, not always, um, who would, would call you usually by Mr. or, or Mrs. Um, so there was an air, uh, uh, there was respect for you. You were treated as an individual and of course you were conducting your business by speaking to an individual and also signing a check so your personal handwritten signature was important but you were you were conducting business and the basis of that business was on trust you walked into the bank and you were who you said you were and the business was conducted and the system worked and there was an air of quiet calm about it what wasn't happening was that you were work, walking into the bank and the moment you opened your mouth, somebody was saying, well, before you speak, I need to check who you are. I, I need to know what your date of birth is. I need to know what your fingerprints are. Well, in an old fashioned bank, it would be good morning, Mr. Garish. Nice to see you again. They wouldn't need your identity. Indeed. And also the person, of course, who would be running the bank would be the bank manager. And the bank manager would not only be looking after his employees uh, and have their best interests at heart, but he would also be um, looking after the best interests of his customers. Now, I know we could get into, yes, but they're there to make money. 
but that's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is how you would be treated. Um, now we live in a society where if you call your local authority, you are not treated with respect because you are one of the ratepayers. You are one of the people who are paying for that authority to exist. You are usually treated like dirt. And again, you're going to go through, through uh, security or you may hear a recorded message saying that the local authority won't tolerate aggressive abuse uh, by anybody, whether you're a caller or attending in person. So we, we can say some of this is the result of um, technology and the internet coming in. That's true, but uh, a hospital, for example, used to be a place where you, you would go either because you were sick and you needed some assistance from the NHS or you were going to go in in order to visit a friend or relative who, who was being cared for. And you were invariably treated with respect by the doctors and nurses that you met. And how did those doctors and nurses appear? Well, they appeared very calm, very professional. They were in charge, I think is the word, because there wasn't a cast of managerialists above them telling them or indeed the bank managers how to do their job. Uh, absolutely, absolutely right, Alex. So they, they were calm, the whole system was calm, the hospital was organised, people knew how it worked, many of them because they they worked in the NHS for their whole working life, they were very experienced, they got a certain maturity, and the system worked, albeit that it was having to do that with the complexities of running paper records. How were people dressed? Well, of course, the doctors and the nurses looked smart, they were in smart clean uniforms and one of the things that many uh, many nurses point out is that if they're of a certain age when they started their nursing and when they were nursing at the early parts of their careers they were not allowed to use to wear uniform to work you had to travel to work in your clothes and then once you were there you changed into immaculate clean uniforms and if you, if you dared to wear a uniform on public transport, you were going to be heavily censored. Why? For the simple practical reason that you were, of course, in danger of bringing in infection on your dirty clothes. You, you may have clean clothes, but you sit on a dirty seat. So you were going to wear clean, smart uniforms. And did those uniforms distinguish the sexes? Well, of course they did, because invariably the ladies were in dresses or skirts and uh, uh, the doctors male would be in in their trousers but but you knew who was who and everything was very calm the nhs brutal organization now where the social relationship between people uh, alex is indicated by talking about management um, the management system is now very harsh it's very domineering it's very oppressive we know this because it's people in the NHS are telling us that. And the policy to change the style of management in the NHS has been a deliberately introduced policy. And we can now go on wards that are chaotic, they're noisy, they're dirty. Um, the staff are very fraught, they can be quite aggressive to you. And if you challenge anything, the next thing is the security staff appear and if you're lucky, you're told off. If you're not so lucky, you're out of the hospital. And some hospitals now issue a colour coded card. You get a yellow card or which means you must behave yourself next time. Or you get a red card to say you can't even go in the hospital. Which, so, of course, is bringing the infantilization down, down another level, because once you have installed managerialists on top of doctors or bankers to tell them how to do their job, they will then start treating their own uh, clients as children rather than adults by example for example by holding red cards up to them yes so we we've 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 used the nhs as, as a, a very pertinent example because of course there's so much about the nhs at the moment but has the inside of that organization changed dramatically uh, have we now got other social issues introduced well we know that many nhs people are involved in the uh, the BAME agenda, so they are pushing for black rights or gay rights or uh, many of these other rights as part of their 
job within the within the NHS. The same is, is happening in the military, which we're going to come on to. So we have seen a massive change in the way people address each other and how they behave. And of course, under COVID, um, and I saw this uh, again this morning when I went out for a stroll in the sunshine, people veering off the path um, because they are now conditioned to believe that any individual, particularly if you're older, may have COVID and if they get near you, they're gonna die. So I think we have to say, Alex, that on top of the plan put forward in this uh, table within the Christopher Story book, um, that doesn't even get anywhere near the attack on social relations that we've got under the COVID lockdown agenda. Uh, who could have imagined that? Oh, quite, because the, the entire fabric of society is, is different than it was. And just going back to the, the banking for a moment, as late as about 30 years ago, my father got bilked for a large bill uh, by a couple of men who he thought were leading lights in the local business community. And uh, he knew that they banked with Barclays, one of the uh, big four British high street banks. And uh, he wasn't even looking for them, but he went in to do some other transaction with Barclays and found the two culprits right there. And he had pre-prepared the papers to serve on them to uh, indict them uh, in court for the, the bill. And so he said, ah, oh, gentlemen, just the two people I want to speak to, uh, there's a package for you and a package for you. And of course they opened it and found it was a summons. And then the first thing they did, because these were perhaps early adopters of the new strategy that story's talking about here, I'm entitled to everything. They started saying to the bank manager who was present as, as they were in those days, I'm entitled to respect. Uh, you, I'm entitled to be protected from this abuse by Mr. Thompson, you should have stepped up for me. And of course, because it was an old fashioned bank manager, he had the confidence in his job at that point to say, gentlemen, Barclays doesn't want the custom uh, of, uh, of bill defaulters. Uh, now uh, pay up to Mr. Thompson or sod off and I'll close your accounts. So you can see that that was actually a man, and I'm not being particularly sex specific here, an adult in his job. And I think all that you've just said, including the COVID agenda of uh, beware of the biohazard previously known as a human, uh, this all comes down to are we adults or not? You know, that, that Marxism um, per, uh, performs many of its tricks by deconstructing a favorite word of the French school of Marxism in culture, deconstructing all the ideas in our mind until there's basically only primal and infantile ideas left. And, and we see more of that, or we see this being rubbed in now by the uh, dramatic increase in the use of cartoons within documents which are designed for an adult audience. These, these are coming out from the police, the NHS, from local authorities. So it's a document talking about quite serious things, policy or, or service provision, uh, but in it it will be, uh, it will be um, supported by cartoon images suitable for a four-year-old. Right, let's move on to security. So um, what does the table say for security? It says penetration and demoralization of the intelligence community, police and military. And then in brackets, it says homosexuality, etc. women in the military, collectivization of military power and security. And what is the result intended it's the degradation of intelligence quality, military power and recruitment pool, defenselessness, total unawareness of strategy, idolatry of cooperation, the inability to act decisively and alone. Now, this is an interesting sector, uh, section, Alex, because, of course, there's quite a lot of detail in this particular one. Uh, we don't the more we know. read it, actually, the, the more struck I am by it. He's foreseen so much of what's happened around NATO in the EU, for example. Yes. Uh, well, that is taking us to the drowning in the international cooperation, I think. And the UK column in its um, EU Defence Union article, the series and the timeline, has put out a huge amount of information about this, UK being locked into the political defence objectives of the EU and other countries. But um, where would you like to start in that little thing? They begin with, <clears throat> excuse me, penetration, demoralisation of the intelligence community. 
have you seen this in your career, Alex? Would you be able to uh, say that? I've seen it in spades, actually. The old hands who'd uh, gone through the Cold War, particularly in GCHQ's old J Division, the, the Soviet Union branch, were uh, characterized by enormous worldly wisdom and cynicism about new agendas. And I saw them in the 2000s being weeded out, uh, enticed into early retirement through golden handshakes and the like, because there was no room for them in the new system. You were meant in the new system to go on prejudice uh, or to, to, to be susceptible to mind pictures that were spun for you by the the few handlers who really ran the intelligence community, who I'm increasingly convinced contain uh, a, a, a healthy, or sorry, a, a large sprinkling of Satanists and child abusers in key nodes. And of course, a lot of what they do to achieve their effect is by using the knowledge and connections from inside the service, but using projecting that to clubs outside the service, which then tout for business uh, to do to get the dirty work done. So yes, I have seen uh, above all the demoralisation. It was a terribly depressed place. Uh, in some ways CCHQ and people shouldn't get me wrong I always say when I get onto this point I had uh, happy and fulfilled years there and found hundreds of extremely competent uh, and well-versed people in all uh, all shades of, uh, of the sense of word of the word in GCHQ but there is a general tenor of my memories of GCHQ and not just myself by any means but many of my fellow analysts and even some of the techies that I had less to do with but I did come across them uh, a, a general Paul hanging over the scene of uh, sometimes it developed into absolute depression and I have met more than one particularly fellow linguist who left GCHQ and in some cases um, went abroad as I did afterwards and I bumped into them in uh, in later life because the professions like linguistics and and uh, computer programming are not that great and you will uh, not that uh, numerous and you will come across your old colleagues in later life what a lot of them have said is uh, I was suicidally depressed and uh, in some cases, the staff counsellor or the uh, the internal sh shoulder to cry on service said, why don't you just resign? You clearly don't fit in here. This happened repeatedly, actually. And the, the thing I think that uh, a lot of the depressed people had in common uh, is that they were particularly conscientious and could not tolerate the passing off of mediocre work as though it were the old gold standard GCHQ work of the 1980s. And... Uh it's a personal question. You may choose not to answer it, but you, you left GCHQ, uh, Alex. Was this change in the culture part of the reason that you left? Yes, although I was only um, inchoately aware of it at that point. It was a gut feeling. Uh, there was a time when I found myself shouting at my nearest and dearest and thought, this is not me. What's come over me? Uh, because the, 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 what was incongruent in my head was I love the job. I love the calling. Uh, but I couldn't square it with why we kept finding things coming out of left field and predetermined outcomes being imposed on not just CCHQ, but the whole of the formal security and foreign policy apparatus of Britain and the United States. Clearly, when certain countries that were within our protection did bad things, went to war when they weren't supposed to or whatever, this had been pre-nodded through by people that we knew very little about. And many of my dearest uh, fellow specialists were literally tearing their hair out or I would speak to their wives and they would say he's getting a big problem with his stomach acid or whatever because of this you know this uh this despair so it was part of I was looking for a pretext as it were to to bow out gracefully and uh, in my case it was meeting the right woman to move move abroad to marry but there was a whole bunch of us I think that were in the same uh, same position that couldn't understand why we were so listless in what was supposed to be our dream job. Well Alex thank you very much for taking us through that section and I'll just say for our audience our viewing audience at least that you may notice some slight difference in the screen look maybe even some of the arrangements and that's because we had a small communication outage uh, and we had a delay and we've had to reconvene so if you notice any minor differences it's because we've had to have a break in the uh, recording of this discussion so Alex you you've described the fact that uh, you you joined a career that you were very interested in it was something that you you felt you wanted to do and I will say that I was the same about joining Her Majesty's Royal Navy, which I did back in 1972 as a midshipman. I was only just 18 and uh, I left my grammar school uh, to go to Dartmouth, um, very close to me now really, uh, to join the Naval College. And it was a very interesting experience because essentially I now know that what I was joining was a form of a public school 
So people that came from a public school background felt very, very comfortable immediately with the general organisation of uh, Dartmouth. And, we should uh, probably just for our foreign viewers explain, Brian, of course, that public school is the posh boarding school experience that I had. Uh, although I wasn't born to it, I got myself there with a scholarship. So people abroad thinking, is he talking about government funded schools? No, Brian is talking about these awfully elite schools where you learn to dominate the world. Well, this is a, that's a whole discussion on itself, uh, in itself, um, Alex, and perhaps we'll have to we'll have to do a bit about that. But I, ha I have to say that um, I did I did fit in. I actually enjoyed all of the training that I had at, uh, uh, at Dartmouth. Uh, it was very interesting mixing with these other people that had come from very different schools. Uh, my little joke is that I was able to recognize a girl because I'd been at a, a grammar school. They, ha they had girls at that school. Um, some of the uh, other males seemed to have difficulty recognizing a girl. But um, the training was uh, uh, hard in some respects, but um, not brutal. And um, I went through that training eventually to get into the fleet as a midshipman, as you did. And then I worked my way up through a career over some 21 years. The bulk of my career was very much Cold War, and my specialist capability was being a trained warfare officer, um, an anti-submarine warfare officer, and the part of my career which I found fascinating and I enjoyed the most really uh, was uh, to be out there finding and tracking the Russian nuclear submarines, uh, principally operating in the Nor Norwegian Sea or down into the North Atlantic or off the coast of America. And uh, it was our job to find those submarines and track them. And of course, if, if there had been a declaration of war, we would have been expected to sink them. We did quite a few operations off the east coast of America. So I've got quite a lot of experience of operating with the American Navy and their maritime patrol aircraft, the P-3s. And uh, that was a very interesting time in my life. It was followed by a period in command of one of the fishery protection vessels. That was very enjoyable because to have your own ship to be captain of the ship is, uh, is something that's very special. And I'm very glad I had that opportunity. But of course, what that did is brought me away from the warfare field and very much into a highly political field uh, because of course the supposed role of the Royal Navy was protecting British fishermen going about their business. Uh, but what I actually found was that I was being employed to um, enforce EU fishery rules and that's that's a whole subject on its own. So I, I started to see some things happening in the Navy which I didn't like. Uh, some of it was around this employment with with the Fishery Protection Squadron and as I've said in some of my public talks I remember one dark and very stormy night when we'd boarded a Scottish fisherman uh, off the Scottish coast. He was using nets that were technically too small. The mesh of the nets was too sc small based on the regulations. Uh, the instructions given to me were to confiscate his fishing net, uh, which we did. And of course that fisherman said to me in some pretty ripe language, you are not only destroying my ability to fish, you're destroying my livelihood. You are destroying my family. And I can still remember that man talking to me. And I knew that what he was telling me was essentially correct. And it made me deeply uncomfortable. So that was one of the triggers that really got me to a point where I felt that I'd had enough. And uh, at the end of my uh, time in command of, of HMS Orkney, a fishery protection vessel, I left the Navy. Now, there were other things going on, and uh, what can I tell you? Well, uh, huge change in those 20 years of my career because the Navy changed dramatically in size. Every year was another cut. We lost another ship or several ships, and we were also constantly short of men at that stage. And uh, it was an open joke that every Christmas the Admiral of the Fleet would uh, uh, send out a signal saying that uh, we'd all done terribly well during the year and to thank everybody for their service 
and then the usual nine. And we, we are confident that next year we will deal with the gaps in Manning. We will have enough men to do the job. But as each year rolled on, of course, we had less and less men and less and less ships to do the job. So I, I watched the fleet and the, the uh, manpower of the fleet undermined. And I, I also came to the conclusion that, of course, we were starting to see senior officers simply not telling the truth about what the situation was. They knew what the political message was, but, that, uh, was, but they didn't have the courage to actually tell the serving men and women in the Royal Navy. So this started to make me uncomfortable, but we were seeing some other highly political changes happening as well. Um, of, and the two things, of course, caught, <laughs> were of interest to me at the time, but with the uh, excerpt from Christopher Story's book that we are focusing our discussion on, it was two of the key things listed in the section on security, which uh, uh, I've introduced just before Alex uh, spoke. And what were those two things? They were um, the introduction of, homosexua of homosexuality into the Royal Navy, and also the bringing uh, of women into the um, ships so that women were going to go to sea. And uh, probably it was the women going to sea that I was able to have, have a a special view of because at, at the time it happened I was part of the training staff at Portland and our job was to go on board warships uh, to see how they performed to train them and also to assess them and if you like mark them and so I was able to see ships going through with with all male crews and I was able to see the uh, start of the women coming to sea. Now we've said earlier in the video that we we know that when we when Alex and I have been talking about the issue of women, um, there's been a, some, some prickliness, which we've, we've explained. We are talking in a very detached way here about what's happening, but we're also focusing on the fact that in the demoralization table, which we're, we're using as the foundation for our conversation, uh, the introduction of homosexuals and women into the military is listed as being a key part of the attack on Britain and, and military forces in the West. So we are, we are basing what we're saying to you on what, on what this attack says was to happen. Now, the key question that will be in the minds of many of you, I think, is, well, why would the introduction of women and homosexuals be listed as an attack? And I think I can give some background to this by what I simply observed happen when those two groups came into the serving military. So if, if I take the, the women first of all, originally, of course, uh, ladies, girls serving with the Royal Navy were serving within the women's uh, auxiliary service. So they were there as wrens and they were doing a lot of very good uh, jobs. They were doing some highly specialized work, particularly in weapons analyst areas, um, but they did those jobs based on shore and they did not go on board the ships and the submarines. Uh, there was a clear de demarcation in the jobs and it was felt by what I will call the old style Navy that to bring the girls on board the ships was going to give rise to problems. Well, the political decision was that the girls would go to sea. I saw the first tranches of the girls going on board ships. And I can say that immediately there was a significant difference. Now, what would that difference be? Let me give you something very simple. Uh, previously, if, you, if you'd gone on board a warship, that warship had a particular smell. It was a mixture of usually diesel fuel that would be there, but also the fact that the ship is highly ventilated. So you have a particular smell of the ship, the paint, the stores in it, food perhaps, uh, perhaps even some unwashed sailors and a few other nautical things. But the smell of the ship was a very particular smell. The day you go on board a warship, you step on board a warship and you open one of the doors to go into the ship itself, 
and you smell perfume, uh, things have changed. All of a sudden you're walking down what should be the corridors of a warship and you're almost in Boots the Chemist or you're in, in uh, one of the stores uh, walking around the perfume section. So that's a very simple thing, um, but the perfume meant that there'd been a major change. Many of the girls were selected to go to sea on the basis that their educational standards was actually higher than many of their male colleagues. And the view was that if the girls went to sea, they would actually raise the standards of uh, some of the uh, male sa uh, sailors because they would feel the need to compete with the girls and the whole thing would move upwards. What I actually saw was the exact opposite happen, which was that uh, uh, once the friendship started, the girls were pulled down because um, the life of a sailor is professionalism at sea. Uh, but when you, when you go on the run ashore, you go for the drinks of beer at the end of the uh, cruise or the exercise period. Uh, then life can be remarkably different. And what became very clear was that we, we saw the girls drawn into the rather more senior side of the, uh, the life of being a sailor in the Royal Navy. In fact, there's a good word for that in English, isn't there, Brian? Coarsening. Uh, the young ladies that went to sea were coarsened. That, that is an exceptionally good way of, put, of putting it. And uh, uh, I was able to witness this happen. Uh, in fact, some of the coarsening I'm not even going to repeat because um, some of the activities that some at least of uh, Her Majesty's Navy's finest would get up to um, is not really to be repeated. And I found it a great shame when it became evident that girls were getting involved in some of these practices as well. So we had the coarsening, as Alex has described it, but of course, if you have young fit men and young fit women locked inside a steel box, the next thing that happens is sex. And of course, the rules were that there weren't to be intimate relationships uh, taking place in Her Majesty's warships. But the reality is, of course, young men, young women, uh, they're going to find the opportunity to do that. But what that brought with it was, of course, the start of the breakdown of discipline, because when the personal relationship started, the favoritism started. And of course, the conflict started over who was going to sleep with who. And that conflict could be conflict amongst the female crew members fighting over a male sailor, or it could be the other way around. But let's add another layer because the next thing that started, of course, was the fact, and I'll leave it to the ladies to describe, uh, to uh, measure how accurate I am with this. But of course, many of the girls chose to uh, set their eyes on somebody more senior than, than, than themselves. This is the hidden word hypergamy, the uh, sneaking admission in modern culture that a large majority of women, if given the social freedom to do so, will go for the 20% top men. Uh, this, is, uh, this is correct, Alex. And of course, it, 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 let's, let's talk about fact. It even got to the stage, of course, where you could have the captain of the ship having an, aff uh, an affair with, with a junior female sailor. And what that did at one stroke, because there are no secrets on board a ship, is that meant that the whole structure of discipline had effectively broken down on that ship. And it, it introduced uh, very bad feeling amongst everybody because anybody who knew that uh, the senior officer was doing this knew that he was doing wrong. Therefore, they were working in a compromised system and the poison began to spread. So in making this ob observation, I'm not, I'm not blaming the girls. I'm not pointing a finger and saying, this is the fault of the women and the girls, because that would be wrong. It takes two to tango. However, um, when we come down to the role of the military and how the military is structured around men, and there's a reason for that, a very clear reason, the introduction of the girls into confined working spaces long periods of confined work uh, where 
sexual relations, perfume, favoritism came into play was very quickly a destruction uh, of the, of discipline on board the ships. Now, indeed, the time that this was happening, Brian, was exactly parallel to the US Navy having its own grief with the pilots in that service going through the tailhook scandal and then all being uh, dragged through the coal, uh, hauled over the coals afterwards, and all being made out to be utter misogynists. And in fact, I think you've read uh, entire studies of that phenomenon. And it looks like the Pentagon over in the US and the Ministry of Defense, formerly the Admiralty uh, in uh, Whitehall, consciously continued this program, knowing full well what the consequences would be. That Perhaps exactly they even relish the opportunity post hoc to paint all of the serving sailors and airmen uh, as relics who needed to be uh, retrained or got rid of. Well, this, is, of course, is what happened that anybody who felt uncomfortable with the, this new style of service for the Royal Navy, uh, they either left and a lot of very good experienced people left or they found that they were in a very uh, uncomfortable management system which caused them stress. But you've hit the nail right on the head and there was no collusion over where we were gonna go with this, so I can smile. But in front of me, and I'll put this up on screen for people, I have a book called From Trust to Terror, Radical Feminism is Destroying the US Navy. And this is by a, a former US uh, pilot called Gerald L. Atkinson. It's an extremely good book. Uh, I encourage people to read it. Let me just read you one of the comments on the back. There are several from pretty senior people in the American military. Um, uh, the author says the Navy is being destroyed from within by its own high ranking officer corps. His citations of this cause near total lack of integrity are damning, convincing and shameful. Its present focus on politically correct behavior betrays those who precede them. It makes the reasons clear why the oath of office cites domestic enemies of the constitution. Um, uh, I'll give you one more. Um, this book presents solid evidence of what we have long suspected. The Clintons and their boomer elitists are irreparably damaging the US Navy. If the radical feminists are allowed to continue their agenda, the proud fighting Navy, which won the War of the Pacific, will no longer be capable of similar victory. And of course, this is written, what, over a decade before the scandals that started around 2019 of the US Navy's Pacific Fleet having a series of previously unthinkable colli collisions and uh, onboard run-ins um, of the metaphorical and literal, uh, literal kind since they went mixed sex and, uh, no, not to blame just that, also since the frenetic pace of activity took hold because of, again, undermanning. Uh, the... the all of those incidents, um, Alex, were particularly bad because of the general state of performance of people on board the ships. And uh, some of the reports can actually be found online if you're interested in, and the viewers and listeners want to go and find that information for themselves. But even in the Royal Navy, we had some terrible things happen. Uh, one ship had a very bad grounding where the officer of the watch, so that's the officer tasked with the minute by minute, hour by hour safety of the ship working from the bridge. Um, that officer was having a relationship with the female second officer of the watch, but they'd had a lover's tiff and weren't talking to each other. And as a result of that, a very grave error, uh, a mistake was made in navigation and that ship sub subsequently had an extremely bad grounding. So and before we go any further, um, you and I have suspected strongly, not to put more of a point on it than that, that quite a few of the inexplicable incidents in the British and American militaries in recent years that have involved two men in a particular setting may have been due to homosexual lovers' tiffs, where the eye was not on the ball. Uh, well, Alex, that, that's certainly true. And I was, I was going to introduce the, um, the subject of uh, gays at sea. And we've, we've constantly said that we're putting this forward as factual evidence as to what's happening. Uh, in this format, we're not describing the rights and wrongs. But of course, 
in the military before gays were accepted into the military, um, it was unlawful under military law, military discipline, to carry out homosexual practices within the military, uh, whether that was the Navy or the, the Army or the Air Force. But that rule was, was, uh, was subsequently changed. But when the rule was in place that it was unlawful, of course, everybody knew that uh, gays existed in the military. Uh, that was clear, people knew. However, people were also prepared to turn a blind eye, provided what went on did not impact on other serving members. And so uh, you had a situation where the gay uh, community was there, albeit in very limited numbers, and they were able to have their private lives but woe betide them if they got caught out and were brought in front of military discipline because they would have been disciplined and ultimately kicked out of the service. But the system worked. And the key thing was that the gays had a private life, but they had to be careful. What they were not able to do, and this is the key thing, is to be predatory. What they were not able to do was to target their gay desires on young men, very vulnerable new recruits that were coming into the Navy. And I think you're being perhaps a little gentlemanly about it here. We have to be frank, and there's enough scientific studies and common sense behind this around the world now. There are several risk factors above the background population that increase the rate of predation in the men we're talking about. They've joined a military service. They're more physical and in their body than others. They're involved in hierarchies of power and the very fact of being homosexual greatly boosts uh, the uh, percentage of, of uh, pedophile or uh, hebephile or young person attraction compared with the general population. Uh, again, I, I have to agree with that, Alex, because you, you've... Uh, you, you... You know, you've put it in, in a different language, but you are spot on. This is where the system becomes very nasty. We can say we can now look at the gay community serving in the military and we can put them in different boxes, if you like. There are the people who are gay but carry on a private life. It's their business. They are not mixing their private life and their private sexual activities with their professional military service. And we've got another group of people who are highly predatory and will use their military service in order to source the young men to satiate their sexual de desires. Now, what makes the Navy particularly special in this respect is that when you go to sea and board a warship, there is nowhere to run. You are locked in a steel box. You are locked up. Uh, often for very long periods of time with your colleagues. And when this type of thing takes place, especially for very young, very naive, very vulnerable uh, new recruits, there is nowhere for them to go. And life can become very, very unpleasant for them. Bullying amongst groups of men is bad enough, but bullying where it has a sexual undertone or overtone becomes even more unpleasant. And, and we've seen indeed British and American crews of surface vessels and submarines who've managed just about to hold it together with failing equipment and undermanning as well as the usual uh, new high pressure command structure. But the moment they come ashore, there's fisticuffs with jaws being broken on key sides and quite high profile crews and events being overshadowed by uh, very unseemly signs that you really never used to see, even from the, the roughest sailors in the days of old. This, this is absolutely correct, Alex, and uh, I'll try and embed some of the headlines to emphasise what we're talking about. So remember that this is not Alex and, and myself just giving our personal opinions. What we're doing is giving our personal experience and opinions based on uh, a report that the introduction of homosexuals and women was to be used as a policy, a weapon, in order to undermine the performance of, of Western military. 
So there's one more thing we, we should say about that, I think, which is we don't want to blow our own trumpet, but you were in perhaps the most cerebral branch of the armed forces where, yes, you have to be fit um, and high performing, but it's generally you pitting your mind every day against the, in your case, where, where are the Soviet subs today or this week? And somewhat equivalent in my part of intelligence, where you've got some extremely clever, high testosterone, high testosterone capable adversaries, and you're trying to play chess against them in many dimensions. Now, this is by definition quite a, a characteristic male activity requiring the male brain, requiring lots of calm and focus, and requiring the channeling of all energy, including whatever sexual energy you might otherwise be spending in other ways, into the determination uh, to best your opponent. Uh, in a manly way. So you can't be using any distractions there. Uh, and of course, the other thing that's notable about this is that Britain in particular, even though America had much more money to spend on the military, by the 1980s, the Americans were commending GCHQ and the Royal Navy and specifically our branches, our parts of those branches, for their even America beating ability to keep the Russians in check. And yet those very teams and those high assets, the, the, the marine patrol aircraft, for example, as well as the sonar arrays that uh, your, your teams were developing, were de deliberately got rid of, largely in the Yeltsin era. So the extent that we didn't know where the Soviet uh, nuclear uh, submarine fleet or Russian by that stage was, and at some stages we weren't even tracking their strategic bombers. I can give you a classic example of, of this um, 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 decimation of, of the British armed forces by these sorts of policies in the, the, the sonars that I dealt with. Uh, there was one, uh, we're, we're talking what's called towed array sonar. So this is towing um, a mile long tube, if you like, behind the ship, listening to sounds in the water and processing those sounds in order to be able to listen for and find a nuclear submarine and at the time these were very uh, state-of-the-art systems they were extremely good and they gave the west a huge advantage over the russian submarine fleet now at one stage uh, an existing sonar that i was was using i was part of the teams using this particular sonar had been performing way beyond anybody's uh, wildest dreams it was extremely good and the Americans had nothing to compare with it and then along came another sy sonar system developed apparently in Britain uh, that was going to be even better but very quickly once the second sonar became operational it was clear that it was nowhere as good as the one in service and how, how, can I, how can I be confident about this? Because I was one of the people who wrote the performance report on the relative performance of these two sonar systems. So one sonar was better than the other. Which one did they get rid of? They got rid of the best sonar and replaced it with a sonar which, which was nowhere near as good. And this was, this was yet another thing for me where I began to see things happening within the armed services, the Royal Navy, which led me to believe that the, the military was being undermined and collapsed. If I switch to the army, what did we see happening with the army? Well, of course, one of the key attacks was the undermining and removing of the regiment system. And the regiment system was so important because it meant you had groups of men uh, from the same areas of the country uh, serving together. And this built up the friendships and the bonding and that unit op operated together. Why are the Scots regiment so strong? Because when those men are together, they're all Scotsmen. They bond as Scotsmen. They're gonna show they're better than those English people. And that gives you the inherent strength. And that was what the British regiment system was about. And of course, what did we do over a number of years? we utterly destroyed the regiment system uh, by amalgamations and simply wiping some of the regiments out. So and this is this word joint, or it even became um, um, a cynical adjective used in the military and intelligence world in the 90s, jointery, 
everything had to be tri-service, whether it was military or intelligence. All three agencies or all three armed forces had to do things together. And indeed, this is what Christopher Story draws attention to in the table, isn't it? Nothing will be done on our own anymore, even as GCHQ or the Royal Navy or the Army or the RAF or MI6. No, we're going to require our American and European partners to help us do every job. Uh, that that is again is correct and it would be Alex because we were working we've been working in in, in different sides of the same system as it were uh, but originally of course the uh, uh, the British military forces had a very special relationship with the American forces we worked extremely closely together particularly in the maritime fields and uh, that meant that if units American and British units were operating together there was an easy um, um, synergy between them. You didn't really have to worry too much. All of the organizational um, information and the command and control, it all slotted together. This and is that... exactly what Lenin and Trotsky envied and hated so much, actually, when they talked about the Anglo-American enemy as the main enemy, which was a, a set phrase throughout the Soviet Union. And as we're now dis discussing, it has transposed itself into the West and embedded itself there. The envy was that the British and Americans, competent uh, and determined though they were on their own, uh, when they got together with the Britons, uh, the, the British side enhanced by the Commonwealth greatly, uh, these were two blocks that became one, to the extent that when Churchill met Roosevelt um, uh, in one of his wartime visits, the combined crews of the warships could effortlessly sing a whole hymn sheet together, such hymns as Our God, Our Help in Ages Past. So there was a complete cultural understanding. And you know, against those who would now claim this was white male supremacy or white Anglo-Saxon Protestantism, uh, the black sailors from both sides uh, were just as versed in these hymns and in the sailors' culture that went with it. Yeah. So that special uh, relationship was very, very strong and it was very effective. And then I, I've mentioned this in, in other arenas as, as well. Of course, NATO was the cornerstone around the whole lot, but within NATO, a very strong pecking order. So the, the British and the Americans were the key team. Um, then we would have the uh, Canadians the, and the Dutch, the Germans. And after that, um, it became rather looser and the confidence in the reliability of the other so-called NATO partners was always slightly suspect. And this is why it became very interesting when the focus switched to the European Union arena, because we started to see the forcing together of, of uh, British units uh, with other European military, um, whether, whether it was the French or the Germans or the Dutch or the Italians, where, wherever, that started to take a more prominent part. Um, and really, I'm going to say the heart of the military wasn't in it. They did it, but they never felt entirely comfortable, certainly not in my day, because that NATO structure was all, always so powerful and efficient and worked so well. So we started to see these changes. We started to see Britain not able to produce its own military equipment. We couldn't produce our own tanks. We couldn't produce our own ammunition. We couldn't produce fighter aircraft on our own. We had this is to... the defencelessness that's mentioned in Christopher Story's right-hand column here. Well, 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 indeed, we had to we had to partner uh, with the French. Uh, so the uh, Tornado aircraft or the Jaguar, we had uh, to partner with another European nation. Um, nobody ever in the beginning understood why, but of course it's obvious now why, because as you partner, so you start to lose your own capability and drive to produce the systems that we really need. So all of these political, political objectives were going on uh, through the grain of the military services, but also on the periphery. And what they did step by step by step was to weaken uh, Britain's military strength. And I'll, I'll give one more example of this. And in about 19, I think it would have been about 1990, 1991, we suddenly had these very strange studies paraded through the Royal Navy. And apparently, uh, well, we were told then that um, uh, those people who were wise were looking into the future and they said, well, we don't think people are going to join the military 
for a lifetime career. We think that in the, in the future, um, people may come in and do a short period in, in the uh, military, but then they'll leave and they'll go and work in a uh, they'll go and work in a in a big global company or they'll go and work with boots. And then telling, isn't it, that the short service commissions were modelled on the kind of graduate recruitment and retention initiatives coming out of the merchant banks and the like. The idea of getting brains for three years at their youthful peak, squeezing them dry and then getting rid of them. Yes. So, so we saw we saw the um, uh, we saw these questionnaires coming around asking people, you know, why they were serving. Now, the strength uh, of the military has always been on people that joined for careers. They were going to join at eighteen or younger, and they were going to stay until they were fifty-five. Some people longer than that, and many of the people who joined under long service conditions would come from families with a tradition of other family members serving long periods in the military. And this gave an inherent strength and depth to the professional quality of Britain's armed forces. And yet what was done, and it was clearly a, a deliberate policy, was to undermine those long serving people and to constantly be stirring the recruitment pot with the objective that you were going to get people, better people, who were only going to serve for shorter periods. And in, uh, one of the things has happened in the police as well, but I'll, I'll talk about it. Um, the police started to introduce a system where effectively you were going to come from university, you were going to do a rapid promotion course, and then you were going to be a, an inspector without ever spending any real time on the beat to gain experience as, as a constable. And that idea was also brought into the military to the extent that at one stage, they had people coming in from university and, and being a lieutenant in the Royal Navy uh, on the basis they weren't fully trained, but they were so bright that they could have the rank, that rank, which is a competent rank. If you're a lieutenant, you know what you're about you're capable of, of uh, having total control of the ship as the officer of the watch, as it's called in the Royal Navy. Um, so you were a fully qualified and competent person. In came these people with the two stripes on their arm, but of course they had no experience in the job whatsoever. And there were a series of incidents where um, sailors, more junior people followed the instruction of these new coming lieutenants and there was there was some very dangerous incidents occurred and as a result of that some of these initiatives were withdrawn but nevertheless the initiatives which were clearly undermining this long service long tradition deep professional training uh, for the military uh, the policy was clearly calculated and now with the hindsight of quite a few years, I can say it was designed to undermine the performance of our military. And the remarkable coincidence, of course, is that this is fully in line with Christopher Storey's table from the KGB saying how our military was going to be undermined. And it comes to a point at the end, doesn't it, Brian? Because uh, he's uh, given, Mr Storey has given at the bottom of his uh, right-hand column for this entry, idolatry of cooperation, that's the partnerships and jointery and inability to act decisively and alone. But just before that, he's given the key insight, total unawareness of strategy. Now, that is what has been deliberately, I think, thrown away uh, because uh, at UK Column, we often cover the unification of defence industry at European and even uh, world level now with the North American and European players coming together. So at the level of the city of London, Manhattan, globalist thinking, uh, which is infested with this Marxist globalism now, uh, there is definitely going to be a producer or two of tanks and things to terrify populations. Obviously that's going to continue. The artificial intelligence, whether in the military or the intelligence services, is going to continue to save manpower and be even more insidious in working out wh where groups of people are not in step with the agenda. But I think the giveaway is within a given previously competent national military branch, particularly in Britain and the US, 
uh, what is deliberately being forsaken is people who know the adversary, people who know what Russia will be doing in 10 years time, people in my case in GCHQ um, who really know Russian idiom or Arabic idiom or Chinese idiom well enough to do a good transcript that accurately reflects what the adversary is thinking instead of making it up on a wing and a prayer as um, sadly so many GCHQ transcribers and analysts ended up doing and I know that there's equivalents in the military as well people telling uh, porkies about their, their supposed certain knowledge of what the Russian or Chinese military is planning to do. So that's the giveaway, isn't it? That there's never going, there's no longer going to be any national element uh, to the military or intelligence. It's going to be global and it's going to be much more akin to totalitarian policing of the domestic population. Uh, well, unfortunately, that, that's absolutely the case, uh, Alex, isn't it? And uh, what better example have we got than the use of 77 brigades to as they say, it's their words, their job is to spy on the British population in order to ensure that the population is doing as the British government tells them. So I here's the really wicked thing, of course, we have perfected that with 77 Brigade and 13 Signals Regiment. And now the fresh Biden administration seems already, as they have done with previous British in initiatives uh, in the American globalist pool, to, to be gleefully about to pluck the fruits of that and refine and Americanize it. Uh, and yes, and of course, that it will be fed back into the British system as well. Who, who gains ultimately? Well, the globalists gain. And this is where in, in using that expression and getting into this area, we're starting to put some more flesh on the table from Christopher's story, because we are starting to show that, of course, the agenda that is unfolding is not as simple as simply saying, oh, well, it's those nasty uh, Bolsheviks, or it's those unpleasant Jewish people, or it's the bankers, or it's a number of other so-called political groups. Now we're starting to see that if we would pick this thing apart, we've got to really look at who the people are as individuals and how they're connected. But um, I've got an eye on the clock, uh, Alex. We, we've We've been pretty direct in uh, pulling apart what's been happening in the intelligence services and the, uh, the military uh, over um, how many, the last 20 years we're really talk talking about, uh, maybe 25 years. But it's been evident that uh, Britain's armed forces and intelligence services have been under a constant and vicious attack in order to undermine their strength and their capability and their resolve. There is no question of this. And uh, uh, I, I laugh with, I'm afraid, black humour when I see senior British military officers now appearing on television in their combat gear, camouflage combat gear, in order to give a briefing as to how their troops are assisting with the so-called COVID pandemic. It's not enough that they appear in uniform and talk about their troops in order to get the message that there's a major crisis, they have to appear in camouflage gear. Um, and are these uniforms not known as battlefield fatigues, Brian, which indicates or implies that the battlefield is our own country? Well, that's that's correct. Battlefield uh, fatigues. Um, so we've got the military being drawn ever deeper into the general um, political arena within UK and of course Mike Robinson from the UK column has been particularly outspoken on the fusion doctrine where we have seen this um, this put forward as as policy where we're to um, integrate armed forces and intelligence services security services police into one amorphous mass which of course can be targeted on an enemy, but increasingly it seems that that uh, power base, that fused system, is going to be turned against the, uh, the British public. Where has that ideology come from? Um, I'll leave that as a question, but I'll add to it, isn't it fascinating that a, that a KGB defector was able to point so accurately at what was to happen in Britain in the future, uh, when his um, his piece was was released in 1980 or shortly afterwards. It truly is remarkable, of course, uh, but this is the way these things go in very long cycles. And we could have said so much more 
even about the uh, years after the Second World War, the setting up of the Marshall Plan, the role of W. Averell Harriman and others who uh, later in life frankly admitted that they were deliberately unifying the militaries of the Union of the, of the European continent and later the British uh, adding in to that mix. And the same thing happened largely through MI6 with the Gladio networks of supposed stay behinds to fight a supposed foreseen communist invasion. But the, uh, the upshot of that was actual uh, false flag terrorism. Uh, and ultimately, again, the creation of uh, European wide intelligence services that claim for political and funding purposes that they absolutely cannot operate without each other. So you don't even have national sovereignty in intelligence either now. Uh, all part of the same mixture, but going back many decades and stemming ultimately from an envy and hatred of what Britain and other English speaking countries uh, are about. You know, in a nutshell, if you're in the military or an intelligence service watching this and wondering whether we are. Uh, a couple of old crazies and, and jaded has-beens talking about this, just ask yourself, do my comrades or do my commanding officers have an innate trust in us? Uh, do, would they actually trust, trust us to be around them with weapons uh, or people even higher than us uh, on a visit? Or would they think that we needed political uh, talking to's and, uh, and pat-downs before we got close? Uh, do our commanding officers and the politicians above them even believe in our country? Uh, or do they seem to be half openly saying that there needs to be a radical change of the population, that the population is the wrong one? Yeah. Alex, um, what I think we should do, because I think really we should end this because it's been quite a long part two. Um, I'm just going to read through what the intended results were of the attack on security that's here in this table, just to remind people. Um, so uh, basically intelligence community police and military were all to be attacked as a block and and what was this to do it was to produce degradation of the intelligence quality military power and recruitment pool defenselessness total unawareness of strategy idolatry of cooperation inability to act uh, decisively and alone. And I think that we have to say that if we look at the current state of our military and intelligence services, our security services, many of those uh, intended results have been achieved. And of course, uh, the majority of people, in, including politicians, are completely unaware of the attack that has produced uh, these damaging changes. So this, this agenda is doubly successful. It's not only achieved the results, but it's also managed to achieve the results without people understanding they've been attacked in the first place. Of course, because the discourse is we're on to something greater and better. The whole of Europe or the whole of the NATO area is getting better and better, supposedly. Uh, but there's nothing concrete that's, that's delivered on time. No weapon system or, or a database is ever on time and in budget. No. OK, we'll end on that uh, on that note. Um, we're going to come back for part three, where we'll be introducing uh, the attack on internal uh, politics and foreign relations. And if we have enough time, we'll try to get on to the subject of, fa of family and society and possibly health. But the key areas for part three uh, with Alex and myself will be internal politics and foreign relations and that will give you plenty of scope Alex and I just want to end with a note I'm fighting my corner a bit here but do not um, misinterpret what we are saying about our recognition of uh, the input that women have given in the military this is this is a completely different subject to be talking about what has gone right and what women have been able to do and what tremendous skills many of them have brought to the military. Uh, we're not attacking the individual women, we're talking about the policy that's been unleashed. And then I'm going to say with a very big smile on my face that what we're doing this evening would not be possible had, th uh, had not three ladies, very um, mature ladies at the time, grandmothers, stood up to help make the UK column possible. So three grandmothers got up to fight for their country 
and to help create the UK column, which has subsequently grown into the um, into the uh, media uh, organization it has. So uh, I have said on several occasions, and I'm going to repeat it again, I saw more bravery, I see more bravery in many grandmothers than I do in Britain's senior military officers, whether they are serving or retired. So I'm going to say, ladies, I couldn't give you a bigger compliment than that. And uh, no doubt I will make some enemies having said it. Alex, any closing comments? Just to endorse that, and I know that however I say this, I will be thought of by some as patronising women, but UK Column is an example of this. We have, I think all of us in the core team, uh, uh, unusually male type brains, uh, I don't mean anything negative by that, but that's just the way it is, refined by the things we've done, including time in service, or in other cases in uh, the in industry, uh, using our brains. And we are endorsed back to the hilt by our women folk, who are just as acute, uh, and often much more intuitive, to, along with the acuteness than we are, as to, to be able to see what's going on. But it is not their calling in life, as well-adjusted women, to sit in front of the camera or uh, at the computer plotting these developments and reporting on them and attracting the publicity, including the negative publicity. Uh, it is a teamwork that goes on. And that's, I think, how uh, anyone classically would look at the, the issue. It's not a question of a battle of the sexes. It's a question of where people in the usual run of events feel that they are more comfortable serving. And if you deliberately mix that and whisper into people's ears that they are unfulfilled or that the other man's or the other sex's grass is greener, then you get the kind of results we've been talking about. Yeah, indeed. So we're, we're going to say thank you to everybody of whatever sex or orientation that's standing up to do something for your country. We aim to help everybody, to help all of you, by exposing how we are being attacked at the moment, what this psychological attack is, and when we can understand it, we can do something about it. So that's the end of part two. Please join us for part three, uh, which will come out in about a week's time. Thank you very much, and thank you, Alex. Goodbye.